before we get started, if we could uh, just bow our heads so I could pray real quick. Father, I come asking that you bless, that you touch, that you pour, that you ignite, and that you give yourself through this vessel unto your people. That whatever words that I may speak may glorify you, that we may be open to hear and accept what you will have us to hear. Lord, we thank you for the, your presence. We thank you for this fellowship. And most of all, we thank you for this opportunity. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Having this uh, great opportunity to be able to talk to you guys is awesome. Um, one thing that I've been uh, toying with in my relationship with God is to always be ready whenever he grants an opportunity. <laughs> and so... <laughs> And so when you ask God for certain things, you need to have an expectation that what you ask for, he's going to actually give you. And so I thank Jim and uh, Weinbrenner for granting me this opportunity to talk to you a little bit today about black Christology. But in order for us to understand black Christology or to lay a foundation for what we're going to discuss, we need to go to a scripture that's going to actually put your mindset into a different place. Because it's from this scripture that we're going to launch out into what it is that the Lord will bless us to discuss today. So I want you to turn in your Bibles to Exodus, the third chapter. And we're going to start at verse one. For some of us, this is a scripture that we know, but I don't want you to bring what you know. I want you to lay down what you know. And allow God to speak to you through this scripture, because when he speaks to you through this scripture, your perception of what black theology is will begin to be formed. In Exodus, the third chapter, looking at verse one, reading from the New Living Translation, it says, one day Moses was tending the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led the flock far into the wilderness and came to Sinai, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the middle of a bush. Moses stared in amazement, though the bush was engulfed in flames. It didn't burn up. This is amazing, Moses said to himself. Why isn't that bush burning up? I must go see it. When the Lord saw Moses coming to take a closer look, God called to him from the middle of the bush, Moses, Moses, here I am, Moses replied. Do not come any closer, the Lord warned. Take off your sandals for you are standing on holy ground. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. When Moses heard this, he covered his face because he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord told him, I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard their cries of distress because of their harsh slave drivers. Yes, I am aware of their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and lead them out of Egypt into their own fertile and spacious land. It is a land flowing with milk and honey, the land where the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites now live. Look, the cry of the people of Israel has reached me, and I have seen how harshly the Egyptians abused them. Now go, for I am sending you to Pharaoh. You must lead my people Israel out of Egypt. I want you to keep your Bibles open and we're going to go back to verse seven, but we're going to put some things into a perspective. Black theology or black Christology starts at a point, and you've read this in the Carcanian book, of a place of oppression and liberation and freedom. At this time in this scripture, the children of Israel have been in Egypt in a slave situation for 400 years. And so I'm going to read these scriptures again and I'm actually going to put it in the perspective of America in 1619. 
when the first slaves come to the United States. And all of you in this room now are going to view and hear this scripture just a tad bit different. But you're going to hear the scripture from the perspective of a slave that was brought from Africa to the U.S. in 1619. Now the words are going to sound just a tad bit different. But you'll be able to receive how that vantage point of hearing this scripture ties into their context. Then the Lord told him, I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in America. I have heard the cries of my daughters and sons and their distress because of their harsh slave drivers. Yes, I am aware of their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the power of the American slaveholders residing in the South and lead them out of slavery in the South into their own fertile and spacious land. It is a land flowing with milk and honey, and it's beyond the southern borders. It's that northern land that they will be led to where they will no longer be slaves of slave drivers. Look, the cry of the people, the African slaves, has reached me. And I have seen how harshly their slave owners have abused them. Now go, for I am sending you. You must leave my people out of slavery in the South. Scripture, interpreted in that particular context, gives us a foundation for some of the things that black theology or black Christology actually deals with. For me as an African American male, when I was reading the book and the materials, it was interesting to gain a perspective on something that I really had never focused on myself. I didn't know that I actually brought the history of my ancestors to my interpretation of the Bible. I didn't know that when I read scripture, maybe I was looking at it from the vantage point of those who had come before me. I didn't know that in the books and everything that I was reading that people were telling me what kind of it meant to be black. And not just what it meant to be black, but I actually what it meant to be black and be in relationship with God. So when I would be in the different settings that I was in, I always wondered why I would hear sermons about someday being free, someday not being oppressed, someday not having what I would sometimes hear is the white power structure oppressing me in some manner. And I didn't fully realize until I was probably reading through the materials that I do bring those aspects to the table when I look at black theology. And then I started to look at, well, what's the progression? What have I looked at from the historical perspective of what it means to be black and to believe in Almighty God? And so I started looking at these different words when you look at the African or well, the African slaves at that time, there was a progression just in even the use of words. And we heard about that earlier today from Dr. Whitaker. He talked about how words and how our use of words, we define words by words. So I got to look at this progression from African slave to Negro to the N-word to black to African-American. 
And I said, wow, I said, you know, these things, these words, and all of those words actually could refer to a particular person or a particular group, but in their context, I would react to those things differently. And so I'm looking at this and I'm going, well, God, how do I, how do we begin to look at this issue of black Christology because if I'm only focused on my perspective or a perspective that's been given to me by other people, then how then do I find or develop my true relationship with you? Because God, I just don't think that you see me by color, but I'm in a world that defines me by color and race and gender and whether I have money or I don't have money, or my political views. It's all these different lanes. And I'm just like, God, I just want to know what the lane is that you want me to have. And then there was this question, and I wrote this down. How do I, coming from that historical perspective of slavery, oppression, all the rest of that kind of stuff, how do I deal? How do I relate? How do I believe? How do I follow? How do I live out? How do I commit my entire life to following this Jesus that I've seen growing up in school who is blonde with blue eyes and white? And that could be a depiction of someone that enslaved my ancestors or oppressed me or oppressed my loved ones. How do I rectify, how do I come to grips and follow you if that's the only image that I've been given? So this black Christology is born out of a mindset or an aspect of oppression, discrimination, a need for liberation and freedom. And there's many different perspectives, both African American and the African perspective that comes to that comes together in order to give us an example of what black Christology is. A couple of the things that I was able to take some notes on and I want to make sure that I point this out is the black Christology or black theology comes from the experience of black people because we all bring our experiences to the table when we go and read God's word, when we encounter other people. And sometimes our perspective is actually formed by people other than ourselves. When I read through the materials, I said, wow, God, I said, this is awesome. I'm actually getting the opportunity to understand what the black theological or the black Christological perspective is because maybe these voices and this experience has not been brought to the people as a whole. So as a result, in order to fully understand my relationship with you or my relationship with my brothers and sisters in Christ, I have to hear from everybody. I have to learn what it is that you will have me to learn in order to be able to truly love my brothers and sisters the way that you command. So as I'm looking through the material and I'm thinking of the black experience, one of the things that the material pointed out is that theology at this time, I guess, had been just created by predominantly white males of the West and there needed to be another voice that was heard. Because in order for me to truly understand this God that I love, this Jesus who saved me, the Holy Spirit that indwells me, I need to make sure that the perspective that I have is not just my own or that someone else actually imposed upon me. So James Cone, and it was interesting reading through the materials as black liberationist, he defined liberation as working so that the community of the oppressed will recognize that its inner thrust for liberation is not only consistent with the gospel, but is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so I got to thinking about this freedom aspect, liberating, being free from something, and the black experience. And we started out looking at slavery, things of that nature, but slavery is over. For some, there's still human trafficking that's going on. So 
you move into the civil rights movement, things of that nature, dealing with racism and discrimination and all the rest of that. And maybe slavery as we once understood it is over, but maybe there's this unseen form where I can prevent you or put you into a box and not allow you to be able to progress to the levels that God might have you to be able to progress because of your skin color. So with that, I began to look at these different points that James Cone brings out from what he says, the black theological perspective or black Christological perspective deals with. First, he talks about the black experience, which is a totality of black existence in a white world of oppression and exploitation. And some of the stuff that I'm going to talk about, I don't agree with. So I'm gonna just let you know that up front. Because my perspective cannot be isolated to just someone else's view, I have to also bring my own perspective to it. And so looking at, if I always continue to look at the world from the perspective of being oppressed by white people, then I'm never going to look at white people as potentially being my friends. I'm going to look at you as the enemy the majority of the time because you represent oppression. And if you represent oppression, I'm not going to hang out with you. I'm not going to hug you. I'm not going to love you the way that I need to. But if I only bring that experience, then what I've done is I've actually locked myself into the black theological box. And I can't come out of it because you've told me how I'm supposed to look at God. And I only look at God that way. So as a result, I'll never see you the way that God actually has created you. So my experience, it can't be that just this one group oppresses me because that's not real talk. Real talk is people within my own race oppress me too. So if we really are going to get down to the nuts and bolts of this theological perspective, I'm actually going to shatter the box that I started with. Because that box was limiting to begin with. And at the end of this discussion, you're actually going to understand that the theological perspective of oppression and, and liberation and all the rest of that actually deals with this three-letter word that Jesus took care of on the cross, but we'll deal with that at the end. Some of y'all already got it, but we're not going to jump to the end. <laughs> so he, he goes into point two and he says, well, black history is white's treatment of blacks and blacks' resistance to oppression. And I, I do have a, a, a great respect for uh, James Combs position. But because I serve a progressive God, that means that my revelation of him has to also be progressive. It can't be that I always stop at a point or I stop at the red light and it's really not red, it's green. But I just stop because I'm comfortable. And if I stop because I'm comfortable, then eventually when God tries to move me out of my comfort, into areas around people that don't look like me, act like me, talk like me, all the rest of that kind of stuff. I'm going to resist, not because God doesn't want to move me, but because I've locked myself into this box. That's good. I got to give y'all just this point, a little uh, personal experience of my own. When I first came down here to Weinbrenner, I said, this school is not going to change me. <laughs> I'm a black Baptist preacher. And the theological perspective that I had at that time, because I went to a black church, and I'll talk about that a little bit too, based upon this theological perspective, but I went to a black church, and in a black church, you really don't go to school all the time, because then you might wind up learning more than the pastor, and if you learn more than the pastor, then, you know, <laughs> you're going to have to go. <laughs> so... When I got down here, and you know, Sunday mornings, we talked about it at our table, it's the most segregated time in the world, and, and we all know that. But the interesting thing is, why is that the case? It's segregated because of the choice that we made, because we're comfortable in that regard. And so we all worship in the same God, but we go to all these different centers, and we go to these centers because that's where we're comfortable, and then at the end of the day, I really do think that there's not segregated areas in heaven. I just think it's just one heaven with a whole bunch of people. And so, so this historical perspective, when I got here, I said, you know what? Because 
my theological box was so small when I came here to Weinburner, I started to see all these other people that worshiped that didn't look like me. And so, and it wasn't purposeful. I know the, the, the people here at Weinbrenner, they didn't have this diabolical plan to change the way that I thought and all the rest of that kind of stuff. They didn't sit in little rooms in the back and say, how are we going to change how art thinks? <laughs> I didn't do that. What they did, though, was they just said, hey, you know what? We welcome you in. You're going to have some experiences that are going to make you uncomfortable. You're going to learn some new languages. You're going to eat the Lord's Supper with some people in a different way than you usually do it. You're going to hear some preaching and some praying and all the rest of that. And you know what? And we just want to love you, and that's cool. And we're going to make you read books. <laughs> <laughs> and so they did all of that. And by the end of my experience here, I was like, wow. I said, it's all these other people that just love God that don't look like me. And so then when I went back to Toledo and I would go to the worship place that I was at, I began to see that we were limited by our theological perspective because it was just comfortable. And so then when I wanted to get out to see people who didn't look like me, it wasn't as easy, but it was always going to be necessary. Because my experience couldn't be limited now because my box had been shattered. Let's get to this next point. And three, what James Cone talks about is he says black culture, which is the self-expression of black community in music, art, literature, and other creative forms. Our praise team has given this awesome, man, just praise aspect. They make me want to shout, I cannot sing a lick. <laughs> and it's been great because that could be an aspect of what the black creative aspect of music is. I would challenge you, though. Don't think that because they're black, that that's the perspective that they bring. They just so happen to be black and are praising God. Because right. right. there's a difference. One other thing, there's three more points that Cone brings out and I'll jump to these other aspects. Cone talks about, he says, revelation, which is a past event in God's present redemptive activity on behalf of blacks. And as I read that, I was appreciative of the fact that he talked about revelation being something that God brings to his people. I looked at it a little deep, deeper, and I thought it was somewhat restrictive because as I got up here and listened to the different speakers, it seemed like we all needed to be free from something. We all needed to be redeemed from something. Our mindsets, our comfort level, our ability to interact with others, yes. whatever it is, it seemed like, and, and Janine did a great job of the oppressive mindset that even me as a black male will bring to a perspective relationship. I always love to confess stuff as God lays it in my spirit. When she did that great uh, depiction of the woman at the well, and I'm going to touch some of you right where you are. I thought that the guy was going to be Jesus. And I thought that the girl was going to be the woman at the well. Why did I think that? Because I brought not a black perspective, but I brought what? A male perspective. So I needed to even be free from that aspect. This next part that he talks about, so that to me is an aspect of revelation where God shows you something in an event that you didn't know before, it's revealed to you in a new way, and then you take that new way and you give it to other people. The next point that Cone talks about is he deals with scripture. And he says that by, the Bible is a testimony and a guide to God who acts as a liberator. And the Bible can become revelation in an event when God and human beings meet in an event initiated by God. And it's interesting because now I'm seeing that those events that God initiates and he brings humans together is not just a black thing. It's really because God initiates it. It's a God thing. 
And when we start to expand our view past the color of our skin, and whether or not some of us look a little more tan than others. Come on. At the end of the day, God initiates where we get to come together and have the opportunity to learn more about him. When I, had the, when I was blessed to talk with Jim, it was awesome because I said, well, you know what? Whenever it's a divine appointment, I got to take it because right. he's the one that gave it to me. And so when I get the opportunity to look out and then our perspective gets expanded and we get the opportunity to talk and just discuss the God that we serve, and how scripture and how, how we bring ourselves to scripture, I need to be able to hear from my other brothers and sisters, what is your perspective? Because that might not be my historical understanding. And if I can understand your historical understanding and you can understand mine, then maybe we could love God together and not separately. That's good. Maybe when racism and all, that other, and all them other isms. Isn't it interesting? We got all these isms. And they're based on what? Nothing. It's all based on how you view things. And so if I can see in this room a diverse group of people, this diverse group of people can interact with other individuals outside of this place. And it does say that Jesus came to save the entire world, not just one group. So when we look at scripture, God gives us revelation, and then in 6, Cone says, tradition is another aspect of our experience. He says that how the church has understood the gospel in varying contexts becomes extremely important to the black theological perspective. Another point that I was looking at and taking notes, it says African Americans bring their own stories to bear on the Bible and tradition. And I think that that's great. But I think that that's limiting because everybody in this room brings their own stories to the Bible and how you read it. Some of us have gone through different things and so you're going to read scripture deeply in a different way because it's going to touch you where you are. It may touch you where you've been. It may also give you revelation on where you're going. And so we all bring our different stories. But watch this. Thank you, Father, for this. You can't be trapped by your story. Because to be honest, everybody in this room's story, I need to know at least a little bit about it or at least be open to hear it because inside that story, there's this aspect of my father, our father, that's going to give me greater illumination on how I could be in relationship with him. That's good. So everybody's story kind of intertwines because if we're all a part of the same kingdom, which I believe, then everybody's story is important. So I don't know if I'm telling you all the stuff that black theology I'm supposed to say about that or if I'm challenging a whole bunch, but I'm almost done. And I'm not sure how I'm going to wind up, but God knows. Now this guy, James Evans, he raised, and I just took some points on what it was that kind of popped out to me. James Evans, he says that the two stubborn facts of African-American Christian experience are God has revealed himself to the black community and that this revelation is inseparable from the historic struggle of black people for liberation. I think what Mr. Evans says is awesome. It's great in the sense that God has revealed himself. But it's also exclusionary. <coughs> because he hasn't just revealed himself to us as black people or one particular race. He reveals himself to all of us. And so as a result, I need to hear about the experiences of others in order to maybe be freed from some of the things that other people just told me. Share some stuff with you just, you know, that I hear as a black man sometimes. It's, you know, white people do all this stuff. You guys have a whole lot of power. And I don't know why. Because I haven't met that white person that has all this power. <laughs> that might make some people in this room uncomfortable. And that's good. Because somebody has ascribed to you all this power and some of you don't even know that you got it. 
but at the, end of, at the end of the day, the thing that's interesting to me is I don't have to ascribe that power to you. If I know God for myself, then it brings you to a level of where God created you in his image, just like me in his image. And maybe society is just trying to keep us apart so that way we don't get united. Because this doesn't the scripture say where two or more are gathered, he is in the midst. And if I'm not willing to gather with those that don't look like me, then I'm not going to be as powerful in God as I absolutely need to be. So let's get to these next couple points. I think I only got, how much time do I got so I know? I don't want to keep you guys. Okay, bless God. <laughs> so let's look at these three points. Actually, there's, there's four points that he makes as a foundation for black theology. The first is that the people's social location and conditions, location, that the people's social location conditions their biblical interpretation. That's huge because our location, our social location, will condition how we look at the Bible. But I challenge you that your social location changes over time. And since it changes over time, your perspective and your ability to interpret it is going to also change if you allow it to change. And so where you might have been when you were 16, you're not the same as when you're 26 or when you're 30. Your body changed. And when you go to 40 and 50, your body changes. So shouldn't our perspective or our biblical interpretation also change through the various experiences that we allow ourselves to have? And so our biblical interpretation can be set by, it can be expanded by, thank you, Father, or limited by our context. The second thing he said that is a foundation for black theology is what the Bible means for today takes priority over what the Bible meant in the past. Which means that from this particular perspective, whatever we're going through today becomes our priority and I may not talk about the past as much. And there's an awesome piece to that because it brings us into revelation for today. It brings us to a point to try to handle social ills and issues of today. But I don't think you can ever lose or you should never interpret the Bible outside of its historical context in order for you to be able to put it into your modern context. Because if you lose the history, how can you ever fully know that what you're planting today is the same seed that was planted then? And it's God's seed anyway. True. This next point, it says the story takes priority over the text, which means that from this perspective, we may have the ability to go in and focus more on the story than the text itself and to interpret it as a story rather than the text that's presented to us by Almighty God. And this last one I thought was very interesting. It says, an African-American theologian must articulate the liberating hermeneutic that grants authority to scripture in the experience of black Christians. I thought that was great. Said a whole lot of theological words, a lot of stuff that I had to reflect on understanding. But as a pastor, and I, I got to make sure that I give you kind of my own perspective as God is blessing me to be able to provide it. I don't preach to just black Christians. I preach to God's people. And so if I'm, and I had this conversation, it's funny how God works stuff out. I had this conversation with a black pastor. Well, I won't say that. I had a conversation with a pastor who happens to be black. See, sometimes we got to challenge our own language. Because sometimes what you do is I'll say black pastor and you know where you go next? Black church and black people praise a black way. But if I say he's a pastor who happens to be black, now your focus is on what he does for God, not what God created him to be from a racial standpoint or ethnicity standpoint. So we were talking and he, he made this comment. He said, you know, if you're going to have a multi-ethnic church and you're going to talk to God's people, you can't preach the free me from slavery messages. I said, oh, for real? <laughs> I didn't know that. I didn't know that. 
said, she can't preach those. I said, okay. He said, because, and I thought this was a huge assumption. He said, because you know white people won't get it. I said, well, why not? We all are in some form of bondage. Isn't slavery just bondage anyway? And all of us want to be free from something. So maybe I'm not preaching slavery that's already ended, but this other slavery that we sometimes find ourselves in, this three-letter word that Jesus released us from. And I'll talk about that at the end. <laughs> so we have to challenge, even from this black theological perspective, you have to challenge those individuals who will try to bring you back to the box. They'll reconstruct the box because they've never gotten out. And the minute you get out, you start hearing and seeing stuff differently. You know where the scripture says, let those that have ears hear and let those that have eyes see what thus saith the Lord. And I've learned that if I get out the box, there's some people that'll drag me back in subtly. And then my eyes will start to change and I'll see what they see rather than what God will have me to see. So this next part, let's deal with this. This figure of Christ for African Americans, he talks about this in the materials. He says, Christ vested with authority to usher in new age in which the power structures of this world will be overturned and freedom will prevail. And he talks about this from a black perspective where he talks about us having a pantheon of, of heroic figures. And some of the ones that just came to my own mind was uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. We might look at him and what I would call not as the Messiah, but just as a heroic figure who did some things to help change society. And how President Barack Obama actually shattered some boxes. And he actually gave some hope to some individuals who had never seen anyone other than a white male serve as president. And I can't wait until we stop focusing on that stuff. Just get the right people in the right office. And stop being worried about what their color is or what their gender is. Just focus on who they are and what they could do. That's a whole nother. <laughs> so there's these figures and, and from the black theological perspective we didn't take that because our focus may be on stories and then so Moses and Joshua and Aaron and, and Paul and all these people they become a part of a story and they become a part of living examples and Jesus is our example to be able to help us be able to walk this thing out together and so that was the heroic figure piece that he had talked about. But then there was this other real interesting piece. We'll get to reconciling Christ and then I'll have the questions for you guys. I thought it was very interesting <clears throat> where in the materials there's this discussion between a black Messiah and a white Jesus. And I was like, wow, that's, that's kind of crazy to me. How can he be two different people at the exact same time? And I, you know, like I said, confession is good for the soul. When the movie, uh, what was it, The Passion of the Christ came out, I always love when God gives you revelation. I wasn't going to go see it because I had this black Messiah aspect, this thought. And I'll take you to the scripture that, you know, helped form this thought for me. Where I said, you know what, the guy, Caviezel, he's, no, nah, he don't really look like the Jesus that really the Bible should be talking about. Not the blonde hair, the blue eyed one, but he, he need to have some hair like lamb's wool and some bronze color and all the rest of that kind of stuff. So I'm not going to go see the Passion of the Christ because it's not an accurate depiction for me. <laughs> Just not going to go see it. And so my pastor at the time, he had said, uh, you need to go see it, not because of whether or not they could get the person with the right color. You just need to go see the aspect of what Jesus went through for us. And so I went to go see it, and it shattered another box for me. And had I not went to go see it, because of this limiting piece of black versus white, then I wouldn't have been transformed and changed. But I got to take you to the scripture real quick, and then there's this last, this last part we'll talk about. I want you to go to Revelation, last book of the Bible, Revelation, and 
and go to chapter 1. So Revelation, the first chapter. And I'm going to read verses 1 to 16. Just Actually, no, I'm going to start at verse 9. And in Revelation, this is John giving us a depiction of what the Son of Man, for him, and what he gives us, might look like. He says, I, John, am your brother and your partner in suffering and in God's kingdom and in the patient endurance to which Jesus calls us. I was exiled to the land of Patmos for preaching the word of God and for my testimony about Jesus. It was the Lord's day and I was worshiping in the spirit. Suddenly I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet blast. It said, write in a book everything you see and send it to the seven churches in the cities of Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Theatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. When I turned to see who was speaking to me, I saw seven gold lampstands. And standing in the middle of the lampstands was someone like the Son of Man. He was wearing a long robe and a gold sash across his chest. His head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow. And his eyes were like flames of fire, his feet were like polished bronze, refined in a furnace, and his voice thundered like mighty ocean waves. He held seven stars in his right hand, and a sharp two-edged sword came from his mouth, and his face was like the sun in all its brilliance. Now, for me growing up, you know, when it would be this white Messiah versus black Jesus, that was a scripture that people would take me to. And I'll give you just a hearing on what the conversation kind of sounded like. Well, we see this picture on the wall, and Jesus can't have blonde hair, long, flowing blonde hair and blue eyes, because the scripture says his hair is like lamb's wool, which is different than long, flowing blonde hair. I don't have any hair, so I'm not a good example of that. And then there's this aspect in the scripture that says that his feet were like bronze. That's not the picture that I see. So for me, growing up, going to Catholic school, seeing one depiction and then hearing that, it threw me totally off. Because now I get involved from a young age in this white Jesus versus black Messiah conversation, and I'm confused. Because what became more important was the skin color and me being able to identify with Jesus based upon his race or his characteristics more than his spirit. And so as a result, this black Messiah versus white Jesus discussion still happens today. Because for some reason, from a racial perspective, we want ownership rather than just followership, or most importantly, discipleship. So this last part, and I thought this guy at the end, Alan Bosak, was great. And just a couple things that he said. He's a South African pastor, and he differs with Cohn in a lot of his uh, depictions of black theology. He says that Christ is a reconciler of both black and white, that white racism must end, and a slave mentality must be discarded. And I thought that that was awesome in a sense that he's a reconciler, but I think you have to have a more expansive view that he's not just a reconciler of black and white, but he's a reconciler of all people. Amen. Because all of us must be reconciled back to Almighty God, and that happens through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And so a challenge for all of us is not, don't, you know, I, I did these summits, man, they're great. I'm serious. I think the summits are awesome. Being able to come back as, a, as an alumni and all the rest of that, I think it's awesome. But also being a practicing pastor and all the rest of that, take, take a lot out of these summits. And don't let it just be that you wrote a paper but let it be that you apply it in your life. Because you'll put a paper aside. You eventually even forget that you wrote it. But if you apply it, it becomes a part of you. 
And if it becomes a part of you, then you can carry it to people who aren't in this setting. So there's a couple, you know, I, Jim blessed me. He said, hey, Art, you get to fill in. And everybody else did table talk questions. So I just got a couple table talk questions. I just want you to write them down. <clears throat> You'll be able to discuss them. But challenge yourself in your discussion of the material. And before I give you the questions, there's two other scriptures that I'm not going to read, but I want you to look at these as a part of your preparation, not just for writing your papers, but also for your experience with Christ going forward. Look at Luke, the fourth chapter, verses 16 and 21, and also Matthew 5, verses 1 through 12, the Beatitudes. Those help give some greater perspective as it relates to black Christology, but more importantly on a focus of Christ as liberator. Christ as someone who frees us from things. The first question that I'd like you to address in your table talk discussion is, what does Jesus look like for you? Dr. Whitaker kind of talked about that, given physical characteristics and attributes. But just, you close your eyes and you see Jesus. What does he look like? Second question. When have you felt Jesus has freed you from something? Whatever that something was. When have you felt Jesus has freed you from something? The last question, and then I'm going to close with something that God laid on my heart to give. Last question that you can discuss at your table is, have you ever felt oppressed discriminated against or ostracized? If yes, would your view of Jesus change based upon your context? Go back to that time that you might have felt oppressed, ostracized, or discriminated against and ask yourself, what was your view of Jesus at that time? And this last point actually comes out of Mark, the 12th chapter, verses 28 to 31. And I'm going to paraphrase the scripture. It's the great commandment. It says, love the Lord your God with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength. And equally important as this is to love your neighbor as yourself. And this was a question that God just kind of laid in my heart. And I just want to share it. If I am to love my neighbor as myself, and we both are to love the same father. Don't I have to get around and learn more about my neighbors who are different than myself in order to know more about our father who created us? Challenge yourself to get outside of your comfort zone. I think all these theological perspectives are necessary, but I also think if you lock yourself into one perspective, it becomes dangerous for your growth. And at the end of the day, I really like the title of the book. The title of the book is where we should always focus. We got to have the discussions, postmodern, feminine, black, Hispanic, whatever it is. But at the end of the day, it's all about Christ and the study of him.